Hello class, good day, happy to meet you again. The course is post 309 Comparative Federalism and we are moving into our next session which is uh, the structure of federalism. Now, there are three basic structures of federalism. The first structure of federalism is the competitive federalism. And from the word competition, this entails that the federalist arrangement is expected to be competitive in nature. The origin of this competitive federalism is traced to the United States of America in the aftermath of the First World War. There was urgent need for development. And as a result, uh, in the aftermath of the 1930 crisis, it becomes imperative for states in the United States of America to begin to initiate policies and programs that will engender unity, peace, progress, and the continued existence of the nation. The idea behind the competitive federalism is that states within the United States of America at, are at liberty to compete within a particular frame. But this competition is expected to be a healthy one. There was what we call a new deal. And this new deal in the United States of America was the need for states in the United States to see that the economy of the United States of America is brought bound or brought back on the path of development and progression. So nation states were given the leverage to initiate policies and programs that will first track development. To initiate pros, uh, you know, policies and programs that will give the citizens policy options that will as well you know give investors choices to decide where when and how to establish the businesses for profit now states within the united states of america began to you know uh initiate policies and programs that you know was more or less uh, targeted at development. So citizens now were given options to decide on which state to reside because of first and foremost the need to enjoy the government policies and programs. Secondly, the need to enjoy some of the social programs that states may expose. And businesses, of course, are or business interest both local and international, are in search of states that were having favorable policies. And by so doing, you know, the competition that engulfed the states within the United States of America now, you know, lead to development. Now, it is instructive to stay at this, mission, at this point in time or junction that uh, the competition is not really uh, the, the type that will engender friction or you know crisis because the federal government is expected to play the role of an arbiter it is the government that will always wait in whenever a particular state is trying to exceed its areas of jurisdiction especially in the area of competition this competition is expected to be targeted at uh, and uh, you know attaining developmental objective not necessarily trying to you know uh compete in the area of resources between the states now the next level of uh or structure of federalism has to do with the cooperative federalism this cooperative federalism entails that though constitutionally each federating unit has its limitation and areas of domains within which it is expected to operate 
nevertheless this uh, federating units are expected to be uh, you know uh, cooperative in the implementation of policies and programs of the government in other words cooperative federalism emphasizes that the federal arrangements the relationship that will exist between the federating units talking about the federal the state and the local government should be the cooperative type that will ensure peace unity and development like it is known in every federal arrangement what is key is to accommodate the multicultural diversity of the cooperating or the component unit and to engender peace and progress these are the fundamental objective of federalism and cooperative federalism seeks to uh, provide a sort of uh, a cooperative behavior or to ensure that in the implementations of you know policies and program of the three levels of government or two as the case may be efforts must be given or emphasis should be laid on the need for cooperation now the dual federal arrangement has to do basically with uh, the likelihood of tension that may exist between the levels of government in other words constitutionally each level of government has its own limitations and as a way of check and balances there is always need for each level of government to you know restrict itself within its policy domains such that there will be you know uh, checks and balances dual federalism seeks to identify the likelihood of tension or in the area of uh, overlap of responsibility when there is an overlap of responsibility then the dual federalism is the type of federalism that actually tries to you know uh, focus on these tendencies and then uh, the document that is always resorted to is the constitution now in all of the structure of, uh, uh, of federalism worldwide one thing that must be mentioned is the fact that uh, federalism can only exist and thrive in a nation that is democratic this means that a nation has to democratize in order to attain the full structure and future of a federal arrangement a unitary state is not suitable for a federal system because uh, instead of ensuring that powers are distributed there is decentralization there is check and balances it is you know uh, contrary in a unitary system where laws are emanated from a particular single source and there is the tendency of tyranny in an ideal situation federalism ensures that laws or responsibilities is being shared between the three levels of government or the different levels of government that is in existence or recognized by the constitution so in a situation where uh, there is no share of responsibility or there is no decentralization in terms of responsibility and functions then such a nation state can be termed as a unitary state and uh, federalism in that very concept or uh, con con context uh, suffers a huge setback now we will move straight into uh, the benefit of federalism there are different benefits of federalism one of such uh, benefit is political 
like we mentioned in the course of our discussion, that uh, it is in a democratic system that federalism thrives. And one of such benefit is that politically, federated units can come together, establish their political system, and then during election, for example, identify a candidate that they feel is competent enough to, you know, uh, uh, take charge of their helms of affair, and such a, a candidate is being elected into positions of responsibilities. The implication is that when a political contestant is elected on the basis of competence and his capacity to be able to uh, provide for the need of the community of the citizens, then such a society is bound to experience development. When the reverse is the case, then development suffers, community or citizens will, you know, have or find it difficult to assess the basic needs. Now, another benefit of uh, federalism is economic, in the sense that when federalism is created, there is always a room for the sharing of economic resources that can be found within their or within the territory of a federating unit. So when those resources are manned, harnessed, and properly distributed, appropriated, then it becomes a benefit to each of the federating unit. For example, prior to the, the discovery of oil in Nigeria, Nigeria's economy, or the, the mainstay of Nigerian economy was agri. But with the discovery of oil, there was a change of paradigm. There was a change of paradigm from agri to oil. And as a result of this change, it has now, you know, uh, created a lot of other issues that came after matter of it. But nevertheless, our focus is the economic benefit. And the economic benefit entails that prior to the change of paradigm, agricultural, that was the mainstay of Nigerian economy, was what actually financed the discovery in itself. And then the outputs, or, or the agricultural outputs, where what was now used in exchange for some of the, 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 the other benefit that accompanied the discovery of oil. And at the same time, when there was a paradigm shift, the oil that was explored in the Niger Delta was or became the mainstay of the Nigerian economy. And it's the money that is derived from the sources of uh, foreign exchange earnings that is usually appropriated in the national budget, such that all the component units, all the states of the federation will have its own share at the end of every month, likewise uh, the local government. Then the next benefit of federalism is strategic. There are situations where, you know, uh, a nation that has federated will be required to, you know, uh, focus on the need to identify areas where it can explore to better the lot of its citizens. So when federalism is in existence and that the leaders are people oriented, then such leaders will try as much as possible to teleguide the interest or the, 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 the masses interest in such a manner that at the end of the day, uh, the public good will be attained. The next is defense and security. A nation that has federated should be able to rise or raise the needed army and to prosecute any war anytime with the needed resources. 
when a federating unit is facing an external threat or internal uprising, then the population of the federating unit or the population of the federated unit as a whole will be a very you know source of strength to the federation and as such they are able to execute whatever foreign policy they might expose and not only that the state will be able to uh uh you know uh, discern its uh sovereignty and its ability to manage its own affairs now we're going to limit our discussions to the chronology of uh Nigeria's uh, federalism. In the pre-colonial time, the colonial and the post-colonial. In the post, in the pre-colonial time, uh, the history of Nigerian federalism was actually the one that uh, was characterized with, uh, you know, attention. This is because the exploitation that took place, the slavery, the exploitation of both material and human resources that took place, not only in Nigeria, but in Africa and the generality of the Third War, has actually, you know, given the impression that uh, Africa is actually uh, a home, according to the Eurocentric view. It's a home for uh, underdevelopment. Is uh, you know, uh, is in the state of darkness and all of that. But uh, African scholars have been able to establish uh, empirical fact that was able to debunk that particular pre-colonial uh, literatures, and by so doing, they were able to uh, re-establish and change the narrative of uh, Africa pre-colonial experience. This is in the sense that, for example, uh, in the pre-colonial Nigeria, the hitherto existing uh, kingdoms, empires, and uh, kingdoms are known to be environment or communities that respect you know uh traditionality there was a system of education that was in existence and not only that there was a high level of you know cooperation and understanding but during colonialism as a result of the contact between Nigerians or African with the colonial masters, some of these core values has been eroded. One of those values is that it was said that in the pre-colonial time, communities regards, you know, uh, incest as a huge taboo. But during colonial period, those issues were treated with some form of laxity. Now, in the post-colonial period, this was a time where the mantle of leadership in Nigeria was left in the hands of Nigeria. The euphoria and joy of self-determination in the 60s, you know, uh, now made a lot of you know observers to believe that at this point in time it is now our responsibility to chart or chart a course for the development of Nigeria now to take us back a little the little little constitution of 1954 was actually what laid a solid foundation to Nigerian federalist structure in the aftermath of that, Nigeria got 
independent in the 60s and from that very time its federalist structure had witnessed a lot of transformation though there are a lot of challenges as it is presently these challenges in Nigerian federalist arrangement nevertheless has made you know uh, the country to continue to exist and the federalist arrangement maintained the argument of late professor yusuf bala usman is that nigerian federalist structure is one of the most celebrated in the world but nevertheless in spite of these particular challenges or the challenges that has been identified associated with nigerian federalism Nigerian federalism is identified as a model in Africa. So, what we're trying to point out here is that in the post-colonial Nigeria, there were a lot of issues that came on. For example, the Nigerian Civil War in 1967 to 1970, this civil war was associated with a lot of, you know, distractions. The evil community or the Igbo nations uh, wanted to secede and as a result it led to a civil unrest or civil war. This civil war had crippled uh, uh, the eastern economy and not only that on the Nigerian side uh, there were a lot of distractions. In the, uh, at the end of the war when the, 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 the Secessionist surrendered. The then government under Gowon uh, proclaimed the three R's that is reconciliation, recovery, and reintegration. This policy was geared towards uh, you know strengthening Nigerian commitment towards its federalist arrangement and to reintegrate the Igbo nation back into the Nigerian fold. Soon after the, the civil war, there were a lot of efforts put by successive administration to ensure that a uh, Nigerian federalist arrangement is sustained and the cry for marginalization, the cry for, you know, uh, inclusion is appropriately taken care of. We have in the constitution it is enshrined that within the federalist arrangement in Nigeria, that's what we call quota system. And this entails that whenever there is an appointment that will be made at the federal level, such appointment must put into cognizance the diversity of Nigeria. We also have uh, the quota system. And a whole lot of other, you know, instruments that are put in place to ensure that a Nigerian federalist arrangement or Nigerian's commitment to its federalism is sustained. And in the area of uh, funding, talking about physical federalism, there were a lot of things that are put in place to ensure that the communities that are deemed to be the producers of the resources in which Nigerian economy is resting on, such community or communities are not left to continue to wallow in poverty and underdevelopment. Successive administration have made several frantic efforts to ensure that some percentage of what is produced is uh, returned back to those host communities. I'm precisely talking about the, the derivation, the 13% derivation. Now, this is more of uh, like a chronology of Nigerian uh, federalist uh, arrangement. The next we're going into is uh, the institutions of federalism. We have the executive, we have uh, the legislature and the judiciary. Of course, the executives are charged with the responsibility of, you know, 
ensuring the running, the day-to-day -day running of government, and they are mostly uh, elected to serve a particular time of office, and executives, uh, they are, like for example, in Nigerian, uh, uh, you know, or Nigerian federal arrangement, the executives are more or less a standalone institution. But they are being checkmated by the other uh, institution. And among the executive, we have the real or nominal. The real or nominal executive is the uh, executive system whereby an individual, for example, the president and commander of chief of the armed forces is recognized to be the one that is reserved with the prerogative of appointment and he is the leader of the government. He performs uh, both, uh, you know, uh, administrative and ceremonial functions. He is recognized as the true leader and he commands a lot of respect and power reside in his hands. The nominal, ex uh, the nominal uh, executive is the one that is more of the ceremonial. For example, in the First Republic, Nigeria's First Republic, we had uh, a government that, uh, you know, was birthed as a result of the, the, the unity government that was created. The NCNC then could not actually, the 1959 elections, could not uh, produce a substantive, uh, you know, president. So there was the need for uh, NCNC to... Uh, you know, partner or come together with one of the political party, and the political party that felt that was favored was uh, the MPC was the one in the north, NCNC in the east, and AG in the west. So, and the, that of NCNC was favored, and there was a unity government between Tafawa Balewa and uh, Dr. Namdi Azikiwe. Blessed memory. Uh, the real executive then was uh, Abuka Tafa Abelewa, while the nominal was regarded as uh, uh, Namdi Azikwe, who is mostly the ones that perform ceremonial uh, you know, functions. The single plural executive is almost having the same interpretation of the real. The single is just a single, from the word single, it's a single uh, executive that is saddled with the responsibility of both the uh, administrative and ceremonial, while the plural executive has to do with uh, an executive system where, you know, powers is being uh, uh, shared. For example, in, in, in a cabinet system where the, the prime minister uh, is just made uh, one among equals, he is the one that is recognized as the head of the government, but nevertheless, executive power, you know, reside, is reserved or is reside with uh, the the members of uh, the, the the executive or, or parliament, as the case may be. Now, the cabinet system has to do with the parliamentary, you know, system where it is the parliament that ha reserve or that have the executive powers to you know decide. Then we have permanent and uh, uh, political and permanent executives. The political uh, executives are the ones that are mostly elected to serve for a period of time in office, while the permanent executives are uh, from the world itself. It's explanatory. They are permanent executives that hold offices for uh, a very longer period. Now, uh, one of the functions of the executive basically is, you know, to ensure the day-to-day -day running of government. They also uh, uh, are expected to you know, imp imp ensure that policies of government are implemented to the latter and uh, they of, are of course expected to appoint other uh, executives like ministers who uh, will have to be in charge of ministries to ensure that uh, they report back to their uh, principal officers. Now the judiciary is another uh, institution in, within a federal arrangement. Now, the judiciary uh, are saddled with the responsibility of uh, not only uh, interpreting the law, but 
they can as well advise the government and they issue reef and ensure that uh, uh, both the executive and the legislature uh, operate within the confines of the constitution. The legislature is one integral aspect of a federal arrangement. Uh, and the role of the legislature is basically lawmaking. They make the law and they as well play the role of ensuring that government appointees uh, perform their uh, uh, functions through their oversight responsibilities. And um, not only that, the legislatures uh, are also saddled with the responsibility of ensuring that all government appointees are properly screened and each one of them that is deemed to be not qualified, uh, the, the, the legislature, you know, reserve the right to, you know, uh, uh, ensure that such an individual is not uh, allowed to maintain or to, 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 to occupy that very office he is nominated for by the president. Of course, in the relationship, uh, the executive are the ones that are sent to laws. Legislatures are lawmaking institutions. So there are situations where uh, when the executive is not yielding to the demand of the legislature and based on national need, the legislature has or you know has what we call a veto. They can veto any bill to make up a law. And in that kind of situation, uh, you know, uh, the relationship becomes rancorous. In other words, uh, it becomes frosty uh, when there is uh, a, a frosty relationship between the institutions of federalism, then uh, the people uh, will, be, will, will suffer a lot of setback. They won't be able to uh, enjoy the dividends of democracy and, and, and instead of leaders to work towards the uh, you know, betterment of the life of the citizens, uh, they will end up struggling for the sustenance of their you know, offices and all of that. So basically, this is uh, going to be uh, the end of this particular session until we meet again. Thank you for listening.